Oh, someone wants to man this mic. I'll need to... Ooh, that one's on too. Well, we're at the end of the quarter. I'm kind of sad to see this quarter go. Um, next quarter is going to be on the book of James. Uh, it's such a short book, and they're going to spend the whole quarter on it, so I'm going to get into minutia, I guess. And uh, you, you should be able to actually read the book of James through every week. Now, that's what I would recommend. Read through it. Because it's a short, you could even read it in the Sabbath afternoon. You can just read through it. But be, and the reason why I say that is because if they're going to get down into the minutia, you know, like they're going to focus on one verse or a couple of verses or something like that, you need to know the rest of the book. I mean, you have to have that in context every time we focus on a, a, a verse or two. You have to know what the context is. You have to know what's going on in the rest of the book. What is the whole purpose of the book? So, because otherwise you get lost. You know, like they say, you get lost. You, you miss the forest for the trees because if you focus on one tree, you lose the whole aspect of the forest. And that's, that's where you can start getting really off base. So I would encourage you, since it's such a short read, that every week as we study and focus on whatever aspect of James they want us to, and I haven't really looked at it in detail to see what they're doing, but it does look kind of, they're focusing on a verse here or there, and you have to um, have the whole book in context when you when you are trying to decipher it. And and there's one obvious one, I'll, you know, that we will talk about that's always raised controversy whenever I've brought it up. And that's uh, if anyone is sick among you, let him call. You know, blah 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 blah. And people pray and all this kind of. We'll talk about that. That's. I don't know if I'll have that lesson or not, but <laughs> yeah, we can refer to it um, because that one is taken out of context. So just just a warning to you when you when you and if you read the book of James, you'll you'll get it in context, and you know, so maybe you'll, you'll be able to understand it a little better. So anyway, this is the end of the quarter. It's a, a nice one to end on, though, the second coming. Now, the quarter has been on the teachings of Jesus. So this is not an exhaustive study on the second coming. I mean, today's lesson. Today's lesson is in regards mainly to Jesus' teachings about the second coming. And as we studied the Sabbath a couple of weeks ago, it's Jesus' teachings on the Sabbath. And it, so it wasn't like an exhaustive study on the Sabbath, um, but um, it was focusing mainly on Jesus' teachings, what Jesus said himself about those topics that were brought up in this quarter. So uh, this morning's is uh, not much different, and, uh, but it's in regards to the second coming, and uh, it's, it's probably my... Mm, it's probably my, the third most uh, favorite topic. Um, the Sabbath is my first. Creation is my second, I guess. Um, and uh, the second coming is right, right up there, um, along with the Passion Week and that type of thing. So, um, you know, we're, we're living in kind of interesting times. And... Um, you know, every time things things happen, especially particularly calamities, you know, there's there's always like, oh, you know, Jesus is coming, it's got to be soon, it's got to be soon. You know, everyone's talking about it. You know, other people that don't even talk about it are talking about it. So, um, we we live in interesting times. So let's let's bow our heads as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to be here in freedom. We got to be here by choice under no coercion and no fear of punishment and no fear of, of just being here to worship you. We are so privileged. We have inherited such a great legacy in this country. And we don't know how long that will last, but we will enjoy it while we have it. And so we take this opportunity to gather together in your name and claim that promise that you will be here and that you will Teach us and guide us into all truth and that you will help us to see you more clearly and that um, we will become more loving, more loyal, 
more giving, more generous, more loving because we've seen you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, one of the things that was kind of interesting in this whole ISIS or ISIL or however you want to call it, um, it's been very interesting to watch this phenomenon. And the phenomenon that, I mean, people have gone on crusades. I mean, this is nothing new. Um, a group of people have decided on whatever um, to crusade for something, to do something, to establish something. But it has not really been so, um, I mean, what interested me it's not the brutality, I mean, that's the horrible part of it. But it's the idea and it's the attraction that is attracting people from countries like ours and England and Australia to join this movement. And that was really, that's what kind of blew me away. It's like, what? And you know, do you understand it? I mean, so you have to understand it where they're coming from. It's like, what is the mentality of this? That people from England and the United States and Australia even, I mean, countries that are like, oh, you know, they have it pretty good. Why would they go and join a movement like this? And you have to realize that as we're talking about the second coming, which is what we call eschatology, right? It's eschatology, it's the end times. It's kind of how things are gonna work themselves out, how God's gonna work things out on this planet, this universe. What's his plan for the end of things? In the Muslim, the Muslims have an eschatology. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not way out there, but it's an eschatology. They have an eschatology. And there is this kingdom that is supposed to be established on this earth. Does that sound familiar? And this is when they talk about the caliphate, that's what they're talking about. They're not just talking about any country or any, this is the caliphate. This is the Muslim eschatology caliphate of the kingdom being established. And so that is why it's drawing people because they want to be a part of this movement. And, you know, they're seeing that, you know, as brutal as it is and, and whatever, there are things that they quotes offer. I mean, people wouldn't go to it unless it offered them something better. And it's supposedly, you know, freedom from corruption. How many people live in corrupt countries? A lot of people. Millions and millions of people live in very corrupt countries where, you know, justice is, you know, convenient or it's bought off or, well, there's none of that under Sharia law, you know? How many people live in what they think is, you know, less than ideal, you know, you know, where sexism is just present everywhere, you know, there's sex is in your face, wherever you go. None of that there. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and, uh, and where you could be protected. So there's a lot of things that it offers. There's a lot of things that it's, gonna, it's promising and all that type of thing. It's just drawing people to build on this thing. And I go like, well, how interesting that is. How interesting that is. is now, can you think of this? Thing? Pardon? The Nazis? Yeah. So can you think of this on a worldwide scale? It may not be ISIS or ISIL, but it might be something else, but on a worldwide scale. All right, Anne says, whenever God has something promised, the devil has a counterfeit. Yeah, very true. And, and, and you know what it's getting down to? And so this, and, and this, what is prominent about this is, if you haven't picked up on it, it's, it's the coercion. It's, it's the Sharia law is an imposed law. So we're getting back to this law concept. So it doesn't matter whether it's Sharia law or some other law, but if it's the idea of imposed law and imposed law is enforced and, and 
things that break the law are punished. And it's you either follow this or you die. You know, it's maximum coercion. Maximum coercion. It's a completely, I mean, and when you think about it, that is, that is Satan's form of rule. But it has been, you know, we have nothing to say with ISIL and ISIS going on because what did we do during the Inquisition? You know, the, 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 the church cannot come across super clean and, and, and holier than thou and self-righteous and say, look at them, you know, how horrible and terrible that is. I mean, people were crucified, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake. I mean, pulled apart, pulled apart you know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it is no different. Because, it, it, and it's the same principle, the same principle of the God you worship. If you worship a God who has imposed law, and if you, you know, you're rewarded if you keep it, and you're punished if you break it. So, it's no different. It's no different whether you're Allah or, you know, quotes Jesus Christ, you know, makes no difference. It's still the concept of God. That's the same principle. So, um, we're going to talk about the second coming. What, and it talks, it talks about several things in the, in the lesson. It talked about the timing, the, the manner, um, the purpose, and, and kind of in the way the preparation. So some of those we can kind of dispense with real quick, right? What is the timing? What is the timing of the second coming? When the Father says. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody knows but the Father. Okay, it just, it just ends. Okay, end of, that's the end of that one. Nobody knows, not even the Son. Only the Father knows. And we'll get into why that is. We'll get into why that is. But that was interesting that Jesus said that. Okay? It's interesting that Jesus himself said that. Nobody knows. I had a, a tongue-in-cheek answer because, you know, people like to, like to, predict when Jesus is coming, you know. Have you ever been in these movements? I think the last one was, what, about 10 years ago? Maybe it's four more than that. This, some Wilson person was predicting Jesus was going to come. They figured out, they calculated the, the time, the year of the Jubilee, and so, you know, it was, gonna, it was supposed to happen, and some of our own members here in this church got involved with that movement, and uh, we're convinced, you know, Jesus is going to come year, whatever the year that was, and it came and went. It's been gone now for more than 10 years. I mean, what happened to that one? But the, 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 but the, chung, the tongue in cheek question was like, for someone who is out there, you know, out there, this, Jesus is going to come this, this day, blah, 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 blah. And the, the answer to them was, well, but don't you know the Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour? And the person answers back, but he didn't say anything about the minutes or the seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, uh, it, it's just it's it, it just you know, it's just a tongue in cheek answer, but but uh, how people get around, you know, scripture, um, kind of amusing. Yes, Anne. When Jesus said that nobody knew but the Father, he was here limited as a man. Do you think that maybe now that he's back in heaven, he knows? No. Still, only the Father. Sure I think. No, I don't think he knows. Sure he, does. he said so. He said he wouldn't know. He said only the Father knows. Well, but, but he was God in flesh. And you don't think he knew what the Father knew? Everything he did was through the Father and from the Father? Do you think the Father will inform him? Probably. But only the Father knows. I mean, I, I'm just going to take it as, as it is. I, mean, I don't care either way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but the, the thing is, no man knows, definitely. Yeah. No okay. Angel. No angel. Yeah. No one else knows. And sometimes, thank goodness, that is. Um, you know, there could be all kinds of sorts of problems if you, you know, really did know. All right. Okay, how about the manner? The manner in which Christ comes. What was that? In the clouds? The same way he 
arose. The, the way he, so, okay, the same way he rose. The angels did attest to that. The same Jesus shall so come as you've seen him go up into heaven. Okay, that's obvious. All right. What about this secret rapture stuff? What? Are we going to be raptured? Depends on what you mean by this. Yeah, it depends what you mean. We will be raptured. Not secretly, but we'll be raptured, you know? Right? I believe in the rapture, just not the secret one. All right? Okay. So, why do you want Jesus to come? Why do you want him to come the second time? Or what do your friends, why do your friends want Jesus to come? The best reason is to be with him, but to many times we focus on getting out of trouble and pain. <laughs> okay, like what? what? What would be some reasons you'd want Jesus to come? I'd like to see him come. Okay, so reasons for second coming. Okay, so one was to be with Jesus. Uh, was what to put an end to what? End to what? Suffering. Suffering. By the way, will there be an end to suffering when Jesus comes? Not Just totally. not totally. Exactly. So, I hate to, hate, hate to put it to you people, you know, that are thinking, oh, when Jesus comes, that's the end of suffering. I don't think so. I don't think so. For this people, we have to get through the judgment. The yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we're done with suffering, believe me. Because when does the Bible say the end of suffering? There's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more whatever. When does that happen? Yeah, the, the next coming. So, if you're hoping for the second coming to be end of suffering, that's, that's, you're sadly mistaken. At least the Bible doesn't promise that. And there's going to be suffering in heaven. Someone that you love isn't there, you think you're going to miss them? You think, gonna be, you think you're going to be happy-go-lucky? You're going to be just wonderful? You're looking for someone they're not there. Your spouse, your parent, your kids. You're gonna be real happy. You know. We won't be happy, but we are read the scriptures and God tell us what we should do for what we have to do. So yeah. we should obey his rules and his commandments and do what he wants so that we can be with Jesus when, when he comes back to us. Right. Well, what other reasons do people want Jesus to come? I know. If he doesn't come, then destroy himself. Oh, okay. All right. So prevent self-destruction? Okay. Okay, that's, yeah. Any other reasons? Yes, go on. He said it in his word, so he has to fulfill it. Oh, you got to keep a promise, huh? Okay. What else? Boy, you guys are being very good today. Uh, of course, there are many other there, there are many other like worldly times when you want Jesus to come, right? <laughs> you have nothing saved for retirement. I hope he comes. <laughs> no. you're in debt. I hope he comes. <laughs> I'm tired of working. I hope he comes soon. Oh, what? Yeah, hope he, I'm having a great day. I hope he doesn't. You know. 
Yeah, I, I used to remember those people that said, oh, I hope he doesn't come real soon. I want to get married. I want to finish school. I want to get, have kids and all that. Movie. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but that's what they're thinking is at that time. You know, oh, no, I don't want to miss out on this, you know, before heaven. I'm, I, want to get, <laughs> I want to get this stuff done first before heaven, before Jesus comes. You're going like, okay. But see, you know, as we grow up, you know, what were you taught in Sabbath school? Oh, yeah, this, heaven's a wonderful place. You know, you can play with the lions and the bears and the tigers. You know, they're all tame. They're not going to eat you. Well, that, that sounded great at the time. You know, I, I wanted to do that. I loved, I'd, I'd love to be able to play with the tigers. So it's big, fuzzy, wuzzy, beautiful creatures. I mean, if you didn't have to be afraid they'd eat you, I'd love to do that. But, you know, as you grow up in, in maturity and understanding, and realize what heaven's about, you know, that, those, that, that stuff should kind of go away, hopefully, you know, and, and, you're, and, you're, and you want heaven for a different reason, for a different reason. And the definition of heaven is, is where God is. So it's, you want to be wherever God is, as, as Anne was saying. Um, but some people have, you know, interesting eyes, you know, they want... Um, so some people want to escape from debt, illness, uh, bad relationships, lack of retirement, uh, freedom from death, pain, and taxes. I mean, you know, what's, not, what's so, you know. And some people want justice, you know. There's a lot of injustice in this world. And they want that righted. They want that taken care of. That's one of these ISIL things, you know. They want they, they, no more corruption, no more, you know, they want the evil stopped. You want, you, want, you want the wicked punished. You want freedom from oppression. You want um, elimination of evil. You want deliverance from false imprisonment or false accusations. You want to be maybe even, from the Adventist perspective, to be shown that you were right all along. I hope that's not your underlying motivation for Christ again. That at the end... I was right, you were wrong. Now you're over at our side now. I hope that's not your motivation. But I've heard people say that. All of those things are very self-centered. All of those things are very self-centered reasons for Jesus to come. I mean, you could, God could take you to heaven and not even be there, you'd be perfectly happy. You know, if your idea of heaven is, you know, you go to a place where there's nothing happening, there's no pain, suffering, sickness, death, parting, or whatever, God could put you up there and leave you there, and he didn't have to be there, and you'd be perfectly happy. And if that's the reason, and if, and if that's really the case, you may not be there. You are not going to heaven to be inactive to do nothing, to be, to be up there self-centered and doing your own thing. Walking on the streets of gold. Yeah. Floating on the clouds. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, you know, if you understand the universe, how God made the universe and how the universe works, it's a never-ending cycle of receiving, giving, receiving, giving, the angels were, have been ministering. They're in a perfect environment, and they've been ministering constantly. They're ministering in some way before and after. We will have a job to do. We will have a job to do that no one else can do. I don't know exactly what it will be. You know, you might be out in some remote galaxy somewhere doing something. But you will have something to do. You're not going to be up there just draining the heavenly resources unto yourself. That is not the way it works, folks. You know, it, you're going to be ministering up there in some fashion, and you will have something to contribute in some way uniquely that's going to fit in God's plan for the universe so that sin never enters the universe again. You will have a perspective that no one else up there has that we're unfallen. You will be able to help somebody. You'll be able to minister to people, to the new creations or whatever, whatever it is. But this, it's not a, you know, just an easy going 
mindless whatever, you know, that's going to be mind-blowing what you're going to learn and discover and but be able to do. Amazing. So, you know, yeah, the, um, I'm glad you're not stuck in the, that, that kind of stuff, the, the, the more self-centered reasons why you want Jesus to come. But we want to get into the, a little bit into the purpose. You know, what, what is God's purpose for coming? What is his purpose, do you think? So these might be reasons why we might want Jesus to come, but what do you think is God's purpose? And what does it have to do with the great controversy? What does it have to do with the great controversy? Now, you remember the controversy, the great controversy is about the character of God. What does the second coming have to do with that? Think about that. You always have to take every single thing and put it in the context of the great controversy. That is, if anything, because if you don't do that, we're, you're not being faithful to Adventism. The contribution of Seventh-day Adventists to the Christian movement, the, the belief about Jesus Christ and God, is the idea of the great controversy. No other group has that concept. None. And so, if you don't relate that, everything all the teachings, everything that are, is in the Bible to that theme, you're just like any other Christian. Just happen to keep the seventh day as the Sabbath. But I mean, you know, you're not really that much different fundamentally than any other Christian. And so you have to really say, well, what, is, what, is, what does Adventism have to contribute? We don't have the exclusivity here as far as being saved and all that kind of stuff. But what do we have to contribute? I mean, all the different faiths have something to contribute. You know, and we are just building on top of that. You know, we didn't come out of just nothingness. We came out of other Christian beliefs. I mean, people that formed the Adventist Church came from Methodists and Presbyterians and, you know, Seventh-day Baptists and, and all different faiths to, to come to, to form the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it was built on a lot of other foundations. But what did we have to contribute? Well, obviously, a focus on the advent, and, um, which is kind of interesting, because it actually came out of disappointment about the advent. So, um, but what would be God's reasons? Why would it be necessary for God to come, or Jesus to come, in regards to the great controversy? And let's, let's, let's go then to John 14, 1 to 3. John 14, 1 to 3. So this is Jesus, and this is during the Last Supper. And he's about, he's pre trying to prepare them because he's going to be leaving, because he's going to be crucified and then resurrected and go to heaven. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. So I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, which is more of a study Bible, so it's a little bit more accurate than the King James Version. You might have in my Father's house are many mansions, but in my Father's house are many dwelling places, or also technically rooms, if it were not so, I would have told you, I, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. So, in the Jewish culture, what was the significance of Jesus saying this? Does anybody know? Yeah. 
had to do with the weddings and when the bridegroom would come for his bride. Okay. Because coming for the church is his coming for his bride. And they, they didn't know when he would come or what time of day, but he would come and then they would be together after that. Okay. This is, in the Jewish culture, a proposal for marriage. This is a wedding proposal. That's what it really is. They understood that. We don't. Sometimes we, we, re, we read it from our own, you know, culture, and we don't get it. And you have to understand that this is a wedding proposal. In the Jewish custom, when they would arrange a marriage, the father and the son would go to the home of the proposed bride and they would make an arrangement with the father of the bride they would agree on some dowry price to be paid for the bride and then they would seal the deal by what we're going to do today sharing a cup of wine The price would be paid. And then the father and the bridegroom would go back to their home. At this point, the bridegroom is now preparing a place for the bride to come join the father's house. And they would build an addition onto the father's house in order to house the son and the new bride. When that was completed, to the father's satisfaction, the father would say, go get her. So when Jesus said, nobody knows, I don't even know, not even the son, but the father, he was alluding to that same practice. It was only when the father said, okay, you're ready. Go get her. Meantime, what's happening back at the ranch? The bride has no idea. She knows things are going on. Things are being prepared. She does not know when. She's got to be ready every day. Is it going to be today? How fast of a builder is he? How picky is the dad? I mean, you know, I mean, but she's got to be ready every day. She doesn't know. And her wedding party have to be kind of ready too. And they have to be ready for this announcement. And when the friend of the bridegroom, you know, is given the, the task of proclaiming, here he comes. He's a coming. Gird your loins. And so the wedding party would start at the bridegroom's house and go over to the bride's house and there they would consummate the marriage at the bride's house and then after that they would make this procession back to the bridegroom's house and the bridegroom's father's house for the wedding feast and they would celebrate for who knows when a week ten days whatever whatever they could afford that's the imagery. And you know, I went to Thailand like, what was it, 1980? And we went to one of these places that give the culture and stuff like that. You know, you're kind of into the culture. And they had, uh, you know, the dancing and that type of thing. But they had a wedding portrayal. And it was just like that. It was just like that. I mean, it was like, this is, a, this is an Asian culture way they do things. They do it just like that. And, it, and, and they would process from one place to another and the lights would be going and it was beautiful. But it was like, wow, this is just like Jesus described it. This is just like that culture is, is, is like that. So when Jesus is, is giving this, this is a, a, 
wedding proposal and the price that's paid is his life. When we celebrate communion, we are celebrating that proposal. It's kind of like our re-acceptance of that proposal, that we are being ready. We are ready for him to come, to be wedded. Wedded to God. I mean, that just, just blows my mind, to be wedded to God. Amazing. Well, it's not so much, and I will give you something else. The, the lesson goes into, Jesus talks about the second coming in Matthew 24. And in Matthew 25, he talks about, three, he has three parables there in regards to the second coming. And one of them is the parable of the ten virgins. So look in Matthew 25. And uh, it's the parable of the talents, the parable of the ten virgins, and the sheep and the goats. And we've kind of done one on, one on the sheep and the goats before. But let's look at the parable of the ten virgins. Because to me, the second coming is not the second coming. All right, so Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, so they, they, they are anticipating. Somehow they, they know that it's happening. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert, then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So, what did these virgins have in common? They had lamps. All right, so we have similarities. And then we're going to have differences. All right, so what were their similarities? They all had lamps? They all had some oil. What else? But the, the difference, one of the, one of the differences was the, the wise had extra oil. So they had extra oil, and they had, the foolish had no extra oil. What else were the similarities? Pardon? They are, okay, they all invited. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, they're all invited to participate. They all slept. They, they, all, they all slept. They're all virgins. They all slept. Only one of them is supposed to be married to the brides? Or what, what are they, bridesmaids? Yeah, they're bridesmaids. But the bride isn't part of the story? No. The bride was ready. <laughs> I guess, because they went in, you know. <laughs> but the bridesmaids weren't. All right, what else? What other similarities? Well, what are the differences? They're all waiting. Yeah, they're all waiting. 
Okay, yeah, they didn't, they didn't know exactly. What else? Okay, or they knew at least, they, well, yeah, they knew about the bridegroom, I guess. Well, because it's interesting what happens at the end. So what are the other, let's say, sim or differences? Okay, so the wise went in, right? They were at the wedding feast. And the foolish were not. They were outside. Okay, so they were on the outside, and what else? So they were, they were described as what? Unknown. Not known. Ooh, would that be? Have you ever been invited to a wedding? What would you think if you got there and they said, who are you? You can't, you know, you can't come in here. And you go, no, but I, you know, I, I, I know the, 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 the parents of the bride, you know. They go, no. I went to one once. And then they said, well, let, well, let's go get them. And they come up and they go like, no, don't know you. <laughs> That'd be kind of a, a downer, wouldn't it? I went to one once where you had to be checked off the list. You had to be checked off a list. That was when... Uh, uh, Ron Howard and Cheryl were married. So, you know, I guess it prevents a lot of wedding crashers that way, you know, if you have a list, you know. They do that in Hawaii a lot, right? They just go because there's going to be food there. <laughs> just blend in and, you know, eat. All right. So, there's these similarities, and we could go through all the symbols and, you know, all that type of thing. And there were, so, the, the, the lesson here is that when they, when they started, they all seemed to be alike, right? You wouldn't be to be, tell one from the other unless you're looking for extra flasks of oil, but I mean, you couldn't tell the difference. They're all virgins, which is a symbolism for what? Purity. They all had lamps, which is a symbol for what? The word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. They all had some oil to have light for a while. They all were waiting. They were all invited. They were all supposed to be a part of it, and they, but they all, because of the delay, they all kind of got drowsy, and they nodded off. I think there's something kind of nice about this, you know. It's okay if you nod off. You know, it's okay. As long as you have extra oil, it's okay. I, I, I find encourage, great encouragement of that, you know. I, I don't know about you. So they, they all kind of nodded off and slept. And then, then all of a sudden, it's like on them. And then there's this realization that, all, uh oh, we didn't have, some, half of them don't have enough oil. Their lights are going out. And the others go, you know. So, there is, there's this difference. And um, what, what false assumptions did the foolish virgins make? What false assumptions did they make? That they had enough oil. Right, okay, that was one. They thought, all I have in the lamp, that's good enough. Right, all I have in my tank, maybe a quarter, but that's good enough. Get me where I need to go. My wife is just killing me right now because she can't, go, she can't bear to go under a quarter or a half. She gets nervous under a half, even if I'm driving around town. But, okay, so I got enough. What was the other false assumptions they made? Yeah, that they could borrow some from somebody else. Okay. What else did they assume? The bridegroom would come sooner, okay, yeah, all right. So they weren't expecting the, the, the delay, 
They were thinking, oh, okay, the, the, the kind of the message has gone out. Should be a short time. Shouldn't be a big delay. All right, what else? One of the thing was a false assumption. Okay, so the, the other some, uh, false assumption was, okay, if it's, well, so we run out, we can go out and get some later and, and come back and still be okay. Didn't turn out that way, did it? Not for the purposes of this story. Anyway. So, you know, personalize this, personalize this. Do we sometimes do the same thing? You know, do we think, I got enough oil, I'm perfectly fine. And what is the, what is the oil? The Holy Spirit. I got enough. I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I paid my offering and tithe, I got enough. I got enough oil. Things are great. that you can get it from somebody else. Oh, I go to David Lowe's Sabbath school class. I read Ellen White. I listen to Doug Batchelor. Whatever, you know, it could be some other person. If you're depending upon some other, oh, you know, or my, you know, my dad, he's really faithful. You know, I mean, you, you can get sucked up into this, you know, like, okay, things are okay. I got enough oil. Or I'm getting it from somebody else. It's, it's showing that that doesn't work that way. And it shows that there's a time in which you can't, there's going to be a, the door is going to be, you know, shut. There is a kind of a time of, that's it. There is going to be that. Whether we like it or not, there is going to be this time when it, there is no more decision making. People have actually already made their decisions. It's not that God makes the decision. People have made their decisions themselves. You know, whether you melt in the oven or whether you get hard in the oven, it, it, it has nothing. It has to do with your makeup. It has nothing to do with the heat. The heat supplied, but whether you melt or whether you get hard depends on your composition. And so when Jesus comes, whether you're saved or lost, it depends on your composition. It's nothing that he does, per se, except he just brings the stimulus to bear. So, what is the relationship between, because what was happening with the foolish virgins is that even though they had all these similarities, even though they were all Adventists, they're waiting for the coming of the bridegroom that some of them did not have oil. And what is the relationship between not having enough extra oil, not having enough oil, and not being known? What is that relationship? It's far worse than to not be known. But they're related. They're related because those, that's, the, that's the trend was that there was no extra oil that were on the outside and they were claimed as being not known. And what does that mean? Does that mean like I don't know about you? I didn't know you existed? Because when the oil, there's no oil, what happens? There's darkness, exactly. There is no light. There's a lamp is there, but there's no light. So what is the, what is the relationship between no light and not being known? Not being prepared by bringing in the Not having the Holy Spirit in the abundance. Not having the character of God. Okay, that's right. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit's work is to put you into the image of God, into the alignment with the character of God. Yes? Uh, 
The Holy Spirit is what connects us with God. And if we say, oh, we've got enough and turn around and do our own thing, we're unconnected. I was uh, looking at the first Thessalonians where it's talking about the second coming of Christ. And what I thought was interesting is the chapter before that is talking about sanctification and abstaining from bad things and loving each other. So character building comes before the coming of Christ. If we haven't built our characters, if we haven't had the Holy Spirit prior to his coming, we're not gonna be ready. So when those 10 virgins didn't have enough light, they weren't sanctified. They did not, they were not prepared. What, what is it that brought on the, what is it that showed that there was not enough oil? What? Their lights went out, yeah. But what is it that brought that about? The delay. The delay. If there had been no delay, what would happen? Everybody would have been in. But there was a delay. Yes, yeah. Good question. That's exactly where I was going. Boy, you, you just helped me segue right into that. <laughs> what is the delay? You see, because that is what is what you might say sorted out the group, mm -hmm. right? Without the delay, you would not know. They would look all the same. It's kind of like trees and the trees are all sitting up there you know and then we get a windstorm and a couple of them blow over you're going like what you know they're all they all looked alike mm -hmm. they're all pretty mature you know they're not, they're not just recent but you know they're all the ones that fall down you know you see their disease they're rotted on the inside or the roots were weak or whatever whatever but it looked perfectly fine but you would not have known it until the wind came. And so this is exactly God's mercy is the delay. God's mercy is the delays he puts in our lives. The delays you can look at as like, these are the things that just don't go quite right. You know? They just don't go quite right. You get betrayed. You get lied to. You get disappointed. Someone doesn't come through for you. There is a delay. Your flight is delayed. Your vacation you wanted to do is delayed. Your retirement you wanted to have happen is going to have to be delayed. Whatever it is, you get sick, you get diagnosed with something, or some relationship goes sour. These are delays. And these are times when it can show you whether you have enough oil. God in his mercy sends us delays to help us see where we really are. We would not know otherwise. You know, it's the funniest thing. You know, churches are really interesting places, but one of the things is, you know, when everything is hunky-dory and good and everything's going good, Everyone, oh, everyone is so, you know, everything is great. Everyone loves one another. Everything's getting along. Things are going wonderful. And then something happens. They want to redecorate the church and they, you know, and, it, and it's this color or that color. Or it's that tile versus another tile. Or somebody gets a divorce in the church and someone's on this side and somewhere on that side. Or whatever it is. I don't know whatever it is, but all of a sudden, you go like, wow, I didn't know you believed that. I didn't know you think like that. I didn't know you behave like that. I mean, it's like, wow, these things, we, we sometimes, we don't like them, but you know, they are good for us sometimes. They wake us up. You know, you don't know who your true friends are, do you? you're on bad times you don't know 
And sometimes it takes those things to find out who your real friends are and who's just along for the ride. You do not know. So these things can be tough. I, I'm not saying they're fun. Delays are not fun. Interruptions are not fun. Disappointments are not fun. But they have a way of waking us up, of showing us, do we have enough oil? Do we have, are we responding in a way that Christ would? Would we be known by him as being like him? And so the second coming is really not the second coming. The second coming that we talk about is the third coming. And that third coming means nothing unless there's the real second coming. Not until we invite Jesus Christ to come into our lives and transform us through the Holy Spirit are we going to be ready for the third coming. The third coming means nothing unless the second coming, the second coming, into us, each one of us personally has taken place. If that doesn't take place, the third coming just doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's the second coming, the real second coming, of Jesus Christ being really born in us and growing in us and taking over our lives and molding us and making us into his image. That's the important coming. The other one, that's just God being a hopeless romantic. He's going to come back because he promised. He said, I am going to marry you, and I am going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again and receive you so that where I am, there you may be also. He's going to fulfill that promise. In every single great story, it's always the damsel in distress. And the guy that's going to, the good guy that's going to come in and conquer all and rescue his bride, his lover, and take her to be with him, and they live happily ever after. And that comes from God. Those thoughts, those wishes, those desires, that theme come from God, who loves us so much. And he wants to be wedded to us, he wants to be with us. That tells us the good news about God. That answers those questions about the great controversy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have arranged for us to be wedded to your son, Jesus Christ. You have paid the price for our betrothal. You are overseeing the preparation of our dwelling places to be with you. And you will know when the time is right to send your son to consummate that wedding and that we can celebrate the wedding feast with you in heaven for a long time. Thank you so much for your great love for us, for being willing to give up your son to be wedded to us that changes everything there is about heaven. Thank you for that awesome privilege. May we not throw away that precious invitation. May we be prepared and be ready each and every day, for we do not know the time. That time is as close as our last heartbeat and our last breath. May we take advantage of every opportunity that we are given to be prepared, but to prepare others because we are already prepared. We don't have to make ourselves prepared. We can let you prepare us and let you use us to prepare others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.